Welcome again. It's good to see everyone. We continue our series on the seven signs of John, and today we're at the Pool of Bethesda with Jesus' sign there, and we are in John chapter 5, verses 1 through 17. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now, there was in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is covered by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in the condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And at once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day in which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath. The law forbids that you carry your mat. But he replied, The man who made me well said to me, Pick up your mat and walk. The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd and was not there. Later Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning. Or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leader that it was Jesus who had made him well. So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, My father is always at work to this very day, and I too am working. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts and minds this morning. Well, as I said, we're looking at the sign of the, at the pool of Bethesda this morning. And uh, there's a story that I, that I love, and this uh, police officer was running radar on California Route 22, and he happened to clock this car that was going really slow as he saw it, and uh, when he did the radar on it, it was going 22 miles an hour, and so he pulled the car over, and he walked up to the car, wondered what was going wrong, and so this little old lady rolled down the window, and the officer said, is there something wrong? She said, no, I was going exactly the speed limit. I was going 22 miles an hour, and the police officer said, oh, no, ma'am, that, that's, that's not the, the speed limit. That's the route sign, and so she said, oh, I'm so sorry, and so he looked into the back of the car, and there's three little old ladies back there, and they seemed really upset and shaken, and so the officer looked back there and said, are you ladies okay? And they said, yeah, we're, we're okay. We'll be okay shortly. We just got off California Route 119. <laughs> well, signs are helpful in life, aren't they? But have you ever misread a sign in your life, and uh, all kinds of things can happen. And so we're focusing on these signs. And I said, in John, there's seven signs specifically that are, that are given to us, and we're told that because of those signs, we might believe, to see and believe. And I said that each sign is not just a miracle, but a miracle plus a message. And I said there's four questions to ask ourselves, which is sort of an ancient right in a way, which is, what did the sign mean to the people of that day? What does the sign tell us about Jesus? What does the sign say to me? And who else might need to hear the message that is in that story? And so I invite us to take a look at this. I was thinking, as I was thinking about this story, about a, a book that was called uh, Letters from Katie. And uh, this gal by the name of Katie got out of college, and she was from Tennessee, a real small town in Tennessee, and she decided what she was going to do. Well, she was going to go to Africa, and she was going to work with some orphanage there to volunteer. And so she went to Africa, and she helped these orphanages. And uh, the need was just overwhelming. And when she came back to her home, after a couple of years, she wrote these reflections and called letters from Katie. And one of the things that she reflected, not only on the good that she did, but she felt, some, she said, you know, sometimes being a Christian in the world, because this was her faith that let her do that, she said, I just feel like I've got uh, facing an ocean, I'm trying to empty it with an eyedropper. Have you ever felt that way? That the need around us is so overwhelming, whether you're reading the newspaper in the morning or you're just sort of going into the community and you're looking around and just think, man, the need around me is so overwhelming. And for a lot of us, I think, we are tempted to look the other way. If you're like me, sometimes you go to a big city, right, and you see this is like on every street corner, there's someone who's in need and it looks legit. And, you know, how much they're given, and, it, and you're tempted to just look the other way. And as I look at this story this morning about Jesus, one of the first things I notice about Jesus is Jesus sees the need. 
He doesn't look away. Instead, Jesus reaches out. And I think that's a great lesson for us as we see the needs of the world around us. And, and for sure, it is overwhelming. But I think it's also the case as we look at this is that we think about that, that Jesus sees our need this morning, whatever it is. And so Jesus walks into this pool of Bethesda area. And for a long time, people were saying that uh, the pool of Bethesda didn't exist because they couldn't find it. And they said, well, you know, the Gospel of John isn't, isn't true, but the fact of the matter is archaeologists have uncovered the Pool of Bethesda, and you can see it today. There's pictures of the Pool of Bethesda, and so Jesus walks into this place that was overwhelmed with need, and Jesus knew it. And the rumor was the Pool of Bethesda is if the water was uh, stirred somehow, that the first person in would be healed. So that was the legend. So, of course, every time the water was stirred, there was this just, you can imagine, just the uh, people sort of rushing towards the water, pushing other people out of the way just to try to get healed. And so Jesus walks into this massive humanity around this pool. And Jesus sees this one person as he's looking around the needs, and he sees a man who has been, whom he's told, has been an invalid. He's been lame. He's been practically paralyzed from the waist down for 38 years. And that's his, his life. And so Jesus doesn't look the other way. Jesus goes up to him. Jesus reaches out to the need, and he asks the man a question. Jesus didn't tell him what he needed. Jesus asks, do you want to get well? Wow. And I think that is powerful. So in this first lesson that I learned is, is just to look at the need. And it does pull on our hearts today as we look at the needs around the world. And part of that, too, is when we have a need to be assured that Jesus sees us and Jesus sees our need and Jesus cares about us today. I don't know what need you come to worship with today. And uh, there's so many needs in our world that we're burdened with. And then we have our own needs, whether it's sickness or relationships or whether it's financial needs or whatever they are. Uh, we all have needs and know that Jesus sees our needs this morning as individuals. One of the great things about John is John focuses on Jesus one-on-one -on -one with others. And so that's the first lesson I see. And the second lesson I see is to take a step of faith. Jesus asks this man, do you want to get well? Now that's interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, the truth is if you've been in a certain condition for a long time, not just physical, but any kind of condition, relationship, whatever, we sort of get comfortable in that position, don't we? And it feels like dependency or whatever it is. So Jesus asked him, do you want to be well? And Jesus cares about what we think and about what we feel. And this man replies to Jesus. He says, sir, I've been here for 38 years, but I have no friends, no family to carry me to the fountain when the waters are rippled. Wow. Can you imagine that? So he's not only an invalid. He's not only lame. No friends, no family. And I'm not sure which is, which is worse, right? But Jesus sees the need, and Jesus says, tells him to take a step of faith. Rise, take up your mat, and walk. Now, I think Jesus tells us the same thing. Not exactly that way, but Jesus often tells us to take a step of faith. And there are times when God whispers to us to wait and be still, right? But there's other times when Jesus tells us to rise, take up your mat, and walk, to take a step of faith. Now, actually, when you look at it, it's three steps of faith, isn't it? Rise, take up your mat, and walk. And we all have steps of faith, and it had to go after that. But I wonder today, as we think about our own life, what step of faith would God have you take today? And the first thing might be, what is paralyzing you today, right? This man was paralyzed, and we think about sort of paralyzed as a, as a physical condition, but truth is, it can be a relationship condition. It can be a spiritual condition, but what is keeping you where you are, sort of stuck where you are? And Jesus says, rise, take up your mat, and walk. And I think that is powerful. There's so many places in the Bible, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, where you see people uh, that are challenged to take a step of faith. I think of David, of course going to face Goliath. He had to take that step of faith and be willing to put the armor aside, take a slingshot, what he had, and to go forward and then take five stones and then to look Goliath in the eye and then to uh, throw that slingshot, that rock towards him. I think of Joshua 
on the banks of the River Jordan, about ready to take the people into the promised land. And Joshua had to have faith that God was whispering to him a command that was true, that he needed to go forward, and the waters would stop and would part, and they would be able to go across and, of course, to face the enemy. What is it today that God is asking you to take a step of in your life, a new step, a challenging step? And maybe you felt like you have been frozen, you've been almost paralyzed in your life. I think as we look at this this morning, Jesus would say, rise, take up your mat and walk. And I think that's powerful. And it's interesting, too, because sometimes when we think of this, we think, well, this is a powerful moment. But what happens the first time the man rises, take up his mat, and he's walking? You can only imagine he's probably leaping, right? He's probably rejoicing. And what happens? The religious leaders, the good people, me, <laughs> Oh, my gosh. And you'd think they'd be cheering for him, right? They'd have a positive attitude. Wow, God is still doing miracles in the land. And what do they say? You're not allowed to do that on the, on the Sabbath. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, man. Is there negativity in the church sometimes? I'm afraid so. <laughs> okay, so that's the truth. You share something that God has done to you, and someone wants to shoot holes for it. And, and sure, they weren't supposed to carry stuff around, but this, Jesus said Rise, you're healed. Take up your mat, which has held you back, sort of, and, uh, and walk. And the religious leaders come and say, this is not right on the Sabbath, right? So, uh, but the man sort of pushes that aside, and he sees Jesus again, because he didn't even know who Jesus was. Jesus had slipped away into the crowd, because it wasn't about Jesus in that moment. It was about this man being healed. And I know sometimes when we take a step of faith and do something new, there's voices of negativity trying to hold us back, but hear the voice of Jesus over the voice of those who would hold you back and to realize that God is with you as you take that step of faith. Well, the last spiritual lesson I see in this is that when we have a weakness, we can experience God's strength in a new way. And the first instance, of course, is this man. And he had been there for a long time, but because he was lame, And because he didn't have friends and didn't have family, he was in this situation, he was able to meet Jesus one-on-one. And I think many times in our own lives, when we do face a challenge, when we do face an obstacle, when we do face an illness, we might be able to experience God in a new way, a way in which we never had before. And so that, I think, is one of the lessons that's here. Because he was in that situation, this man was able to experience Jesus in a powerful way. And then I think of Paul, right? And uh, the verse that Rachel read, and I love that, from uh, 1 Corinthians 1.27. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. Which is a short and succinct way of saying, listen, God takes the weak and makes them strong. God takes the moments that are sometimes the crippling and the crushing moments of our life, and in that moment, we feel God's strength in a powerful way that we never would have otherwise. Paul, many times in prison, was able to write letters that touched us through generations that we would not have if Paul had not been in prison. There's another moment where we see, as Paul gets older in life, that there was some kind of uh, illness that he was wrestling with. And Paul prays about that, and he realizes that in that weakness, he's feeling God's strength. And he said, "Is the perfect strength is in our weakness. Today, where is God meeting you in ways that you had never known? Jesus sees this man in the temple later, and Jesus looks at him, and we don't know all that was going on in his life. And maybe he was just sort of being challenged by these religious leaders and confused and not sure about this. Maybe he's starting to catch this negative attitude about himself. And Jesus, uh, as this man comes up to him, Jesus said, see, you're doing well. Stop sinning so something else doesn't happen to you. And Jesus is challenging him, listen, go forward, don't go backwards, right? Listen to the voice of Jesus. Don't listen to the negative voices around you that would hold you back and to pull you back. Today, Where are you? What are you wrestling with? What is maybe paralyzing you or holding you back in life? As you reflect on this story, this sign of God that Jesus is speaking to us through John's gospel, I think there's a powerful message for us here. That Jesus sees our need. 
Jesus sees the needs of all humanity, and sometimes we wonder, how can God, with all of humanity, all the things that are going on, see my need? I think in this moment, John is pointing to the fact that Jesus does see our need, and Jesus doesn't look away. Jesus looks us right in the face, eye to eye, and says, what do you want? Do you really want to get well? And then Jesus tells him the message to take a step of faith. And all of us can take a step of faith trusting with God. Your step of faith might be different than my step of faith, right? But Jesus somehow whispers to us, rise, take up your mat, and walk. Go forward in your life because God can do extraordinary things. That thing that was holding you back, that thing that was keeping you paralyzed, can now become a, a symbol of victory in your life. So where are you? And realize, even as we face some struggles in life, this man still had some things to work out, right? Uh, he still had some issues, and I think, truth be told, that we all have some issues, right? Uh, I'm not the only one, right? That is still working through some issues. God can take those moments of weakness, and God can bring his strength to us to work new things in our life. I want to close with a story that I love. It's a true story of the great uh, Polish uh, concert pianist Paderewski. And Paderewski would go all over the world and give concerts. And um, this mother had challenged her son to take piano lessons and to persevere through that. And she told him that after he had done this and done this little recital, uh, that she was going to reward him and take him to see this great concert pianist, Paderewski, and so he could be inspired and he could be rewarded. And so uh, the mother had gotten seats near the front of this concert hall, and she got in the concert hall down front there with her son, and she began to talk to the gal behind her and just enjoying that. And in the kind of the, the darkness of the moment, the lights were still kind of down. Uh, she did not notice that her son had sort of made his way up to the stage, the piano on the concert stage. And then all of a sudden the lights came up for Paderewski, this great concert pianist, to come out. And only then did the mother and the crowd realize that he was up there plinking out twinkle, twinkle little stars. And the mother was just aghast in that moment. But Paderewski, this great concert pianist, came out real quickly and he just put himself behind this young man and said, don't stop, quit playing. And with that, he began to put in a bass part with his left hand and then he had sort of a running obligato in his right hand and together this uh, young boy plinking out Twinkle Twinkle Little Stars and Paderewski, this great concert pianist, mesmerized the crowd. And I think in the same way, Many times we feel that maybe our step of faith isn't adequate in the moment to overcome whatever we're facing, but if we, if we do it, if we take that step of faith, and maybe it seems humble and insignificant, then all of a sudden we can feel God's arms of strength around us, taking what small moves that we're doing and making something great out of it that everyone can see. Today, whatever is holding you back, whatever is paralyzing you, Jesus comes to you in your moment and looks at you and says, what do you want? What do you need? And we can feel like we can share whatever that is to God. And so listen, what step of faith would God have you take? And then realize, lean into God's strength, not your own, and God will see you through. We join me in prayer. Lord, as we think of this sign in the Gospel of John that rings down through the ages, Lord, help us to realize that you are there, that you see our every need, and that you listen to the voice of our heart, and that you encourage us to take a step of faith, and that you will be there with us in that step, and all the steps of faith in our life. And so we pray that we would take that step of faith through your strength, and we pray this through Christ's name, and all God's people said, amen.